everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Peggy Clark and I'm the co-director of Aspen Ideas Health and the executive director of Aspen Global Innovators Group at the Aspen Institute. So today we're thrilled to host Dr. Zeke Emanuel and Margaret Singer Katz from the New York Times for the conversation about Dr. Emanuel's new book, Which Country Has the World's Best Healthcare? Zeke Emanuel is the Vice Provost for Global Initiatives and Co-Director of the Healthcare Transformation Initiative at the University of Pennsylvania. From 2009 to 2011, he was a Special Assistant in the OMB office in the Obama administration. He's written Reinventing American Healthcare, Prescription for the Future, among other books, and in March 2020, published The Trillion Dollar Revolution with Abby Gluck. And Margot Sanger Katz is a correspondent for the New York Times, where she writes about healthcare for the upshot. She's also a frequent panelist on Kaiser Health News podcast, What the Health? And before joining the Times, she was a reporter at National Journal and the Concord Monitor, and an editor at Legal Affairs and Yale Magazine. Welcome, Margot. Welcome, Zeke. We're delighted to have you with us today. Great to be here. Great. So we're honored to have you with us and thank you so much for sharing your book, which we understand, Zeke, is the most popular of all the books you've written yet. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Margot. Thank you all. Sure. Thank you so much, Peggy, and thanks, Zeke, for coming and doing this and congratulations on the book. Um, thank you. It seems like you really lucked out in terms of timing that uh, you have this book on how to make a good healthcare system at a time when ours is really under extraordinary stress as are uh, many of the other systems that you wrote about as well. Um, so there's a sin in journalism that is known as burying the lead. Uh, so you have titled your book, which uh, country has the best healthcare system. And so I feel like it would be really remiss for me not to begin our conversation by asking you uh, which country has the best healthcare system. Oh, Margo. You're like all my Wharton students. You want the answer <laughs> without doing the work. But one of the things us professors know is that, and you know, that if you got to work at it, you actually retain the information more. Um, uh, all kidding aside, one of the things we did is we went around the world to 11 countries, including the United States, and we used 22 different metrics to evaluate uh, countries. One of the things we can conclude is no country gets an A. No country is good on all the metrics. And a lot of which country you think is best depends upon the metrics you're focused on. Uh, you know, if you're a health policy wonk, it's universal coverage, comprehensive benefits, uh, low costs. Uh, but if you're a regular patient, what you really want is probably good benefits. Uh, you want low cost at the point of care. You want no waiting times, you want low drug costs, you want free choice of doctors, and those get, get you very different groups of uh, countries. We did create a top tier in the end, um, and it was Norway, Netherlands, Germany, and Taiwan, and I put an asterisk by Taiwan. It's got universal coverage, very high satisfaction by the Taiwanese, and very low cost compared to all the others. It's in single digits, but uh, there are two sort of deficits that I do what, feel of compelled to mention. One is doctors are overworked. They see 60, 70, 80, 100 patients a day. So you're not going to get a lot of time with your doctor. And the other is that hospitals are, they've been described either as Spartan or as a uh, undergraduate uh, dormitory room. And uh, they're not the way we expect our hospital rooms. And your relatives are expected to come in and provide the custodial care for you, feeding you and doing the other things that we expect nurses to do, so. I feel like so often when we hear from critics of the United States healthcare system, there's sort of this talking point that like every other country in the world, fill in the blank. There's a sense, I think, in the kind of uh, top line political debate that every other country has figured this out and we haven't. And I think the implication of that is that every other country is the same, which I know is not true, but can you talk a little bit about that? Like you've spent a lot of time with these 11 countries. How different are they? And, and how much should we think of the US as an outlier 
you know, not just in the ways that we think about it, but as being like totally different from these other countries? Uh, they're very different. Uh, you know, one way of looking at it is how they pay for healthcare and deliver healthcare. So you look at England, it's a socialized system. The government, you know, owns the hospitals, owns the doctors by and large. We in the United States, we have that. It's called the VA. And by the way, vets are very satisfied uh, with that system. And then there's sort of, you know, government single payer that pays private doctors, pays private hospitals. We have that. That's fee-for-service Medicare. That's like Norway or Canada. Um, and so we've got that too. <laughs> and then there's, you know, where there's government insurance, but there's supplemental private insurance, and there's some which are light and some which are much more involved. The French are, say, much more involved. They have a state system where every get one gets coverage. It's got very comprehensive benefits, but they're high co-pays and people have to pay out a lot. And so everyone, 95% of the population, buy supplemental insurance to do that. And we have that system also. And then there's system where people pay uh, the government, but they select private insurance. Private insurance then organizes the care, pays the doctors. We have that too. It's called the exchanges, Medicare Advantage uh, for seniors. And then there's purely private where people or companies buy insurance for their workers. Uh, that's Switzerland. We have that too. So <laughs> we have it all. <laughs> and that's part of the problem because it's so complicated in the United States way more complicated than any other country. And that adds a lot of costs and especially a lot of administrative costs that we really complain about. Um, so uh, I would say we have a complicated system. Every other country is complicated, but ours is complicated to another order of magnitude. When you look at all of that variation that you see you know, across the world and you've identified you know, a number of countries that you think are kind of in the top tier, is, is the lesson that you learn that there's kind of one way to do it right, or that there are a couple of ways that can still achieve the goals that you think are really important? Oh, there are multiple ways. And uh, yes, I think you're 100% correct. There are very, uh, very different approaches. So for example, Norway is in the top tier. Uh, you know, by dint of being a citizen and paying your taxes, you get a health insurance and the government collects it uh, like we pay Social Security or Medicare, um, then they pay for regional health authorities, which pay the hospital. They also pay municipalities that actually employ the uh, primary care or, or pay out to the primary care doctors. So that's a classic single payer system. Uh, on the other hand, the Netherlands and Germany are very different. As I mentioned, you pay the government, but the government then pays private insurance and you get to choose which private insurance company you have. Uh, so you've got an intermediary there that is very different from the single payer system in uh, Norway. Uh, so different countries have figured out different things. And again, which system you like depends upon the specific criteria that you think are the best. One of the reasons we selected these countries is they have extensive choice of at least primary care doctor. In Germany, you have choice of any hospital, any doctor, including specialists with no gatekeeper. And so Germany is high on that. Norway has some waiting lists issue, uh, but they have a very comprehensive uh, system. So I think, you know, uh, it, it very much does depend upon uh, the criteria you think are important. I would also say that the Netherlands is very good because they're very innovative. Obviously, we're in the middle of this kind of enormous kind of world historical public health crisis right now with coronavirus. Um, you know, it looks like actually we're seeing like a new surge of cases in the United States, but uh, it's not just the United States that's been affected by coronavirus. A number of countries in Europe and in Asia have had really bad outbreaks as well. And I wonder uh, if you think about this disease as a kind of pressure test uh, for these systems, how you think they have performed and whether you think there are any particular weaknesses, particularly in the US, but also in some of these other countries that you looked at before that are useful in thinking about as you evaluate them? Uh, that's a really good question. And um, I think it's the natural question at this moment. I've written the a coda, uh, literally, <laughs> as we were going to press, I ripped, uh, I didn't rip it out, my editor ripped it out and said, you got to write on COVID. Um, but I think actually COVID, at least in this acute phase, is less about the healthcare system, that, which is more about treating people who have illness, and more about a public health system. And they tend to be run by different organizations, different parts of the government in countries. Um, 
there is, however, one standout, real standout in this regard, and that is Taiwan. Um, Taiwan could have been a total disaster. It's less than 100 miles off of the China coast. A million people who are from Taiwan work in China, and there are scores, if not hundreds, of flights per day in the pre-COVID era between China and Taiwan. So they could have exploded with huge numbers of cases. Instead, they've had 446 cases as of last night, seven deaths. So what can we learn from Taiwan? Well, first of all, we can learn that they were really suspicious of China, given the SARS episode in 2003, 2004, and they didn't trust any uh, infectious organism that came out of China, and they were really prepared. Um, second, they have a face mask culture. They wear face masks for respiratory illnesses, for air pollution, for lots of reasons. It was easy for them to don face masks countrywide. And third, and this is the relevant point, they have a health card uh, where you go to the doctor, they swipe the card, they know that you've come to the doctor, the Ministry of Health knows you've come to the doctor, they know why you've come to the doctor, they know what the doctor has ordered and done for you, and they were able to merge that information with the immigration and customs information into the database, find out who'd been to China and who therefore should be tested for COVID right away. It took only a few days. And then they also found out people who were visiting the doctor for respiratory symptoms, shortness of breath, cough, and were negative, tested negative for influenza. And therefore, they said to the doctor, you've got to test them for COVID. And so this allowed them to get right on all the COVID cases and really isolate them and prevent transmission. That health card is something we and almost every other country could learn a lot from with the ability to push that information back to the doctor and get them to get this test, close care gaps. We can see lots of uh, benefits from that uh, approach. So I noticed that the United States is not in your top tier of countries that have the best healthcare system, which I think, you know, uh, probably some of our viewers uh, already felt that way, but probably some others uh, felt, oh, like we do have the best healthcare system. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering, like, what are some lessons that you've learned from this project about how the U.S. healthcare system could improve? And I sort of want to ask that question in two ways. Like, one, you know, if you could be king for a day or a wizard for a day and wave a magic wand and make changes to our system, what would be the best ways to improve it based on what you've learned? And then the second question is kind of like the harder, more realistic question, which is, given our politics and our processes, uh, what are the kinds of changes that feel like they are achievable that would still get us closer to those goals? Uh, yes. Let's start high in the sky. What could you, if you could, be, if you could do magic, what would the magic be? Um, so first of all, the US isn't in the top 10, but it's not the worst. I reserve that space for China. We could talk about that later if anyone's interested. Um, we do excel at certain things. and and. We excel at innovation, not in terms of drugs, devices, or new surgical procedures, but at innovation in payment, innovation in delivery. Um, we're not solving things yet, and we need to get to scale, but we are being very progressive in that area, and other countries are looking towards us. So I don't actually spend much time worrying about pie in the sky. Uh, um, that's one of the reasons I didn't write this for so many years, despite being asked the question. I do worry about the practicality, and we can do uh, three or four major things, and I think they really will be on the agenda in the next few years. The first thing is, given the fact that 14 states haven't expanded Medicaid and look like they will never expand Medicaid, at least of their own volition, if we want to get to universal coverage in the United States, we have to actually nationalize Medicaid, take it away from the states. Um, my brother and I wrote an op-ed about that uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think. We have to do that. So that's one. Two, step two in my view is we have to simplify the system. And so if you nationalize Medicaid, I think you want to take Medicare, Medicaid, and the exchanges and put them into one system, one exchange where people get, you know, a government subsidy or a government voucher to buy private insurance using the Netherlands and Germany as a model for that. They've shown it works really well. So that would simplify the system. Either you get employer-sponsored insurance, the Aspen Institute gives you insurance if you work for them, or if they don't give you insurance, you go into this other exchange and the government heavily subsidizes your insurance. And I think the main way to pay for that is a payroll tax on any employer um, that does not provide 
insurance to its workers and contract workers. I think this idea that Uber somehow doesn't pay for its people because it calls them contractors is ridiculous. They, uh, along with all the gig workers, self-employed workers, everyone's got to pay into this system. Um, I have some other bells and whistles I would add to that. Children should be free. We should not ask families to pay the full freight for children's insurance. It's very expensive, and I think it's very counterproductive. I think similarly to keep healthcare costs down in this mix, you want to have regulation of drug prices. We could talk about that, but every country regulates drug prices. All of them have some very consistent similarities that we can learn from. We're also going to have to regulate some other prices in the system. And I actually think we want to put a budget on the, at least the government side of it. Um, again, countries that have lower healthcare spending in general, this isn't one-to-one -one causation, but in general, have a budget and have ways of adjusting prices so that they stay within the budget. So I think those four or five changes are the ones I think, first of all, uh, would make this a hugely better system. And second of all, are actually achievable. You keep a role for private insurance, you limit prices where we're paying exorbitant amounts, um, you get everyone into the system in a simplified way. So you obviously have experience not just as an academic, but also as someone who has worked in government. And it just strikes me as a reporter who's been covering this for a long time that the politics of healthcare reform are really, really fraught. You know, the Affordable Care Act obviously did become law in 2010. This was a really big and important law, but you know, it followed on sort of decades of failed attempts to do system-wide reforms. It was really unpopular and in fact, you know, led potentially to Democrats losing power in Congress for, you know, nearly a decade. And it seems like now it's more popular, but it's still, you know, a law that a lot of people are not happy with. And it just seems like big health reform ideas, like the ones that you're talking about, have been very difficult to achieve in our political system. And so did you, can you share a little bit of insight about why this is so hard? You look at public opinion polls, you see that uh, healthcare is a really, really top issue for Americans. They think the system isn't good enough, it's too expensive, it causes them a lot of stress and concern, and yet, on the other hand, it seems like there's so much um, political consternation about how to solve those problems for them. Yeah, and I think you're uh, absolutely right. Um, I think you have to get a coalition. You have to somehow, we have to figure out how to get Republicans to view these changes as positive. Um, and, you know, they viewed opposing the Affordable Care Act as a way of consolidating their base um, and coming back and taking the House and Senate in, uh, well, the House in 2010. Um, but uh, I think post-COVID, uh, that's not going to work. Um, and I think the approach at the Trump administration of arguing against the ACA in the uh, courts is also not going to work. The public, I believe, uh, given the uncertainty and the uh, uproar, really wants security. And one key element of security is coverage, and affordability. Given the fact that roughly 50 million people, both workers and their dependents, are going to lose employer-sponsored insurance, uh, we have an opportunity to provide a lot of security to people who otherwise thought can't ever happen to me. So I actually do think there's a window. And then there's this. Remember, in December 2019, the number one issue was health care for the public. And the number one issue within health care was affordability, particularly drug prices. So I think there's a way of making that. Why is it hard in the, this country? It's all about uh, money, politics, campaign, uh, political parties not trying to advance the public interest, uh, but try to win more seats, uh, even if it's divisive and not actually pushing the country in the right direction. I do think this 2020 election and potentially 2022 are, uh, you know, that they could be the pivotal moment where we've dissuade or, or forego the past and the public really rallies around uh, government being potentially can be for the good and that these reforms, if they can see, it's going to guarantee me health care in a way I like, like private insurance, and it's going to be affordable. These super high deductibles and co-pays, these high drug prices, they're going to be taken care of. I think that's a winning formula. Um, the political science in me when I wear that my PhD hat, you know, we get reform when three trends go together. Everyone views it as a problem. We agree upon a solution. 
and we have a cataclysmic event, call it COVID-19. That's, we are in that moment. And I think, uh, I think we could see some uh, major legislation uh, if the Senate uh, flips. So I want to turn to some audience questions because we have a few good ones. And I just want to encourage anyone who is listening who has a question and hasn't submitted it yet, uh, now's your time. Um, uh, this is a question. Um, oops, sorry. What do you think the U.S. should do right now to stem the COVID pandemic? Many of the suggestions in your book are longer term fixes, but we're in a crisis. What should we do given the limitations of our system right now? That's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you want to focus on just one or two things, by all means. <laughs> It's pretty clear, you know, if you look at New York uh, and uh, New Jersey and Connecticut and Pennsylvania and Illinois, uh, we need stringent national uh, um, adherence to the public health measures. Uh, no crowds, uh, distancing, wearing face masks, um, and the whole series of things. And we need them stringent, not this place does them indifferent. One of the problems is, you know, Florida and Arizona said, oh, it's, it's not here, it's in New York. We don't have to do this. Wrong. One of the things we've seen from Europe, we saw in China, is you put them in stringently. Everyone sticks to them. You can bring it down rapidly, and then you can really open up. And what you do is you do get what the administration has called embers. We're not in the embers category now, but embers that you can identify by testing and contact tracing, and you can isolate those and prevent these big outbreaks which are going into the exponential phase. We didn't do that, which means you need leadership in the country to actually advance the public health measures, to stay six feet apart, not have a Rose Garden event where everyone is chummy and shaking hands and petting each other, not wearing masks, breathing in each other's face. That is a disaster. We know that transmission, there are four things that really promote transmission. One, enclosed spaces, being together in a room. Two, crowds. Three, prolonged period of time, which is why you got about a third of the transmission is in families. And four, deep exhalations, singing, coughing, yelling, uh, sneezing, right? That Tulsa rally, that Phoenix rally, perfect cases for spread. And we're gonna see spread. And that is the problem. And you know we do need to physically distance, to avoid crowds for a prolonged period of time, to wear face masks, and we have to do it seriously. And then open up in stages. You don't open up into situations where people are gonna to be together in an enclosed space for a prolonged period of time, a bar. That's a terrible idea. Uh, another question. When we think about healthcare, we so frequently think about treatment and exclude prevention and public health. Obviously, this is something we're thinking about right now. Which of the countries you looked at have good preventive care and public health? Almost all of them actually do what we do, <laughs> which is <laughs> doctors and primary care responsible for uh, vaccinations, for example. There are some countries which have differences on that. They're responsible at the first level for uh, education. But what you see is that they have bigger public health investments, mostly. Uh, by modeling it um, and creating work arrangements. This isn't a healthcare system problem. This is a public health arrangement that allow people, so example, I'll give you a good example. Norway is a non-religious country. Absolutely, they have an official church, Lutheran church, but Sunday, almost no businesses are open. None. Why? It's family day and they want people outside doing things with their family, increasing social engagement and increasing physical health and exercise. And this is in a non-religious country. So they think about it. Australia, you know, they've surpassed us in terms of uh, uh, preventing smoking by really ramping up taxes, ramping up the advertising that this is bad for you, really trying to prevent young people from smoking. Because if you don't smoke by 21, 25, the chances of you ever picking up smoking are zero. They've actually surpassed us. We used to be the world leader in terms of getting rid of smoking, um, but now Australia is better than us. We have to increase our taxes and we have to, again, re-emphasize uh, uh, stopping smoking. So, you know, the four big things we need to do to promote public health, better diet, uh, uh, more exercise, not smoking, 
wearing seatbelts and avoiding accidents like swimming accidents and other things. And that's, you know, we, it, not rocket science, but, you know, we do agricultural subsidies, not to fruits and vegetables, uh, but to, uh, you know, corn and soybeans. That's a mistake. Um, the pandemic has shined a floodlight on health disparities and inequities in the U.S. healthcare system, and we're seeing, you know, really uh, large disparities and outcomes from COVID. Are there countries that are making strides in closing those kinds of gaps that we can learn from? There are lots of gaps in other countries, and we should be honest. Not, you know, we're, we're focused now on uh, racial, racial and socioeconomic gaps because of COVID. There's also gaps rural, urban. Um, uh, you know, where doctors are willing to practice and things like that. Many countries have the rural urban one, uh, just for example, Australia, Canada, and Norway, where there's big, like our country, 20% of the population rural, and almost no country has solved that problem. They, we all have the same challenges. Um, hopefully telemedicine will solve that. The racial socioeconomic gaps, um, there are other countries that do better. Why do they do better? Well, they have the same system and access to the system and people with low income or minorities are not excluded because of their job or for other reasons from coverage. Nonetheless, they're do even in many of these single payer systems like Canada, there do persist socioeconomic differences and in many countries, even racial differences. You're seeing protests in England, for example, about the race uh, and the latent racism within the healthcare system. So these problems afflict many, many other systems, but everyone's got coverage, everyone's got affordable coverage in most of these systems. And so the disparities to the extent that they're there are much less than they are in the United States. We don't, I mean, we have uh, in some places disparities between whites and African Americans, 15, 16, 20 years on life expectancy. You don't see that in other countries. They are much narrower. Also remember though, a lot of these disparities, going back to the previous question, they're not about the healthcare system. They're about the other stuff, food, housing, the ability, smoking, uh, and the advertising that took place to, to minority communities there. And so getting a handle on those things is gonna be important to, solve, to getting uh, equalization of health outcomes. So we need to address both the healthcare system and these other social factors, uh, and both of them are gonna be necessary to improve and, and bring uh, white African-American, white uh, Hispanic uh, health outcomes together. Well, I wanna just thank you so much. Uh, this has been such an interesting conversation. I'm sorry we only have a half hour to all be together, but congratulations on the book and, and thanks for your thoughts today. And uh, thanks to our audience for uh, joining us and also for asking such good questions and making my job a lot easier. Thank you, Margo. This has been terrific and really, really uh, deep questions. So thank you very much. Take care.